بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين أما بعد قال الحافظ أبو عيسى محمد بن عيسى الترمذي رحمه الله تعالى في جامعه باب ما جاء في ترك الوضوء من القبلة حدثنا قتيبة وهناد وأبو كريب وأحمد بن منيع ومحمود بن غيلانة وأبو عمار الحسين بن حريث قلوا حدثنا وكي عن الأعمش الحبيب بن أبي ثابت عن عربة عن عائشة أن النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم قبل بعض نسائه ثم خرج إلى الصلاة ولم يتوضأ قال قلت من هي إلا أنت فضحكت قال أبو عيسى وقد روي نحو هذا عن غير واحد من أهل العلم من أصحاب النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم والتابعين وقول سفيان الثوري وأهل الكوفة قالوا ليس في القبلة وضوء وقال مالك بن أنس والأوزاعي والشافعي وأحمد وإسحاق في, القب أو في القبلة وضوء وقول غير واحد من أهل العلم من أصحاب النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم والتابعين وإنما ترك أصحابنا حديث عائشة عن النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم في هذا لأنه لا يصح عندهم لحال الإسناد قال وسمعت أبا بكر العطار البصري يذكر عن علي من المدينة أنه ضعف يحيى بن سعيد الخطان أو قال ضعف يحيى بن سعيد الخطان هذا الحديث جدا وقال هو شبه لا شيء قال وسمعت محمد بن إسماعيل يضعف هذا الحديث وقال حبيب بن أبي ثابت لم يسمع من أربة وقد ربي عن إبراهيم التيمي عن عائشة أن النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم قبلها ولم يتوضأ وهذا لا يصح أيضا ولا نعرف لإبراهيم التيمي سماعا من عائشة وليس يصح عن النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم في هذا الباب شيء The chapter says reading from جامع التلمذي it says in the uh, Abu Abu Tahara, the book or the chapters of purification, a very practical issue, especially for those of us who are married, brothers who are married, and you pray in the masjid, or you leave to go to work, or you're traveling to the airport, or whatever the situation may be, a very serious and practical issue that pertains to one of the most important pillars of Al-Islam. Uh, and that is, he says, Babu ma jaa fi tarkil wudu'i min al qubla. If a man kisses his wife, does he have to make wudu after kissing his wife? You're about to go to the masjid, or you're going to Jumu'ah, or the Eid, or you're going to travel to the airport and you have to pray, whatever, and you give your wife salutations. Salaamu alaikum, hug, kiss, you love her, I love you, etc. And then you leave. She kisses you, you kiss her. It doesn't have to be a long, passionate kiss. A smooch, a kiss on the forehead, the cheek, basic affection, and you leave your house. And you come to the masjid for fajr, and then for the daras, etc. Do you have to make wudu again after you've kissed your wife or your wife, your wife has kissed you? Do you have to perform the wudu or not? And it's a very practical issue because many Muslim men, if not most Muslim men, or should be the case of most Muslim men, they should be married, they should pray in congregation, and they should be affectionate to their wives. That's al muftarat the presupposed thought of the average Muslim man who's of age. Once more, the, av- the Muslim man, unless he has an excuse or a reason, he should be married. There's no reason why you should be a grown Muslim man of age and you don't have a major, serious, legitimate excuse not to be married, especially living in America in 2018 or the UK or Canada. You're studying, you just came home from jail, you're sick, you're taking care of your parents, something like that. You're looking for a zoja that's appropriate for you. Something that prevents you from being married. But to be in a normal situation, a comfortable situation, a standard type of situation, and you refuse to be married, that's not necessarily good. That's not necessarily a good thing. It's not a good look, it's not a good reflection. Because if you're not married, living in a society like this, what's going on? Are you not human? And forget the concept of lust and desire, which is a major concept, but let's say, forget it for now, human nature, but just the sheer fact that, yani, your deen, 
and you having a family and a household and just living as a Muslim man. Marriage is a very important aspect of Islam. So therefore, Muslim man being married, having a zoja. Number two, going to the masjid to pray. Very important and practical issue. If you live in a close vicinity of the masjid, then there's no reason why you shouldn't pray in the masjid unless you're sick. You may be ill. Your stomach may be bothering you. You may have problems sleeping, etc. You may be far away from the masjid. It may be extremely cold. It's wet. It's icy. It's storming outside. Something like this that prevents you from going and praying in the congregation. Nah? And last but not least, if you are married and you got to the masjid, then your wife should be up praying when you leave the masjid if she's in a pure state. And even if she's menstruating, you give her a kiss before you leave. As basic affection. And it's from the sunnah to show affection to your wife. It doesn't have to be a lustful type of thing, but basic affection. You give your children a hug and a kiss, you give your wife a hug and a kiss when you enter and when you leave. And obviously, we know that when these basic small acts of affection are neglected and abandoned, it's a major telltale sign that the marriage is not healthy. That the marriage is not healthy. When a man comes home and it's just, oh, salam alaikum. He leaves the house and it's, salam alaikum. Those small things mean a great deal. Like the human body. People that complain when they get older, they get weaker, they get sicker. And they complain about arthritis, tendonitis, and different things like this. In other words, the bone is there. The muscle is there. But the little small, tiny piece of matter that is between those two bones is either weak, thin, or not there at all. The ligaments. And when the little small, tiny, minute piece of matter isn't there between the bones, what happens? A great deal of pain and discomfort is there. You understand this? What's stronger, what's bigger, the bone or the cartilage, the ligament? Of course, it's the bone. I live with my wife. I take care of her. She has a house to stay in. She prays. She wears hijab. Those are the big major things. But the little small acts of affection which are not there is a problem just like the body part. The bone is bigger than the small tiny piece of what? But that makes a what? Huge difference in the smoothness of the joints being moved and functioning properly without pain and suffering. And the same applies to marriage. So when those little small things are neglected and abandoned, forgetfully or chronically, something is wrong. And a marriage is not necessarily a healthy marriage. And you know when you have affection for someone, you can love someone without being in love with them. You can love someone without having affection towards them. You may love someone and treat them cold or on a cold way. But you love them deep down inside. I wouldn't want anything to happen to my wife. I wouldn't want her to you know, die or nothing like that. I love her. I care for her. But there's no affection. I sleep in a different room. I sleep on the sofa. She sleeps in this room. We eat separately. She doesn't wait for me to come home anymore. Something is wrong. So the thing or the default, how it should be, how it should be, we said, life is imperfect. But how it should be is that you should be married. You should go to the congregation and you should show basic affection to your wife. So if all these three things are in effect, this is a very practical issue here. When you leave the home and you kiss your wife or your wife kisses you on the lips, on the cheek, on the forehead, whatever, however she kisses you, do you have to perform the wudu? So Tirmidhi, he, uh, he mentioned this issue in his book concerning a tahara So the hadith is hadith number 86. If you want to reference it at home, it's in the beginning of the book. At-Tirmidhi, he mentions his isnad, his chain of narration that we try to mention and familiarize the Muslims with. Even the layman Muslims, every week in the khutbah, we try to quote the hadith with this chain of narration for wisdom and for purpose and to familiarize the Muslims with the great legacy of hadith and its, its importance. So At-Tirmidhi, he reports from his teachers who are Qutayba ibn Sa'id and Hanad As-Sari and Abu Qurayb huh? Muhammad ibn Ala, Ahmad ibn Ni, Mahmud ibn Ghaylan, Abu Ammar, etc. They narrated from Waqi' ibn al-Jarrah, from Al-A'mash, from Habib ibn Abi Thabit, from Urwa, from Aisha, the Prophet's wife. That the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam, and the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he kissed one of his wives. And then he went out to the masjid to go pray, to lead the companions in prayer. 
and he did not perform wudu. He did not perform wudu after he kissed one of his wives. Qala qultu man hiya illa anti qal fadhahikat. So I said, meaning Urwa, the narrator from Aisha, he says, I said, isn't it you? Aren't you the wife that he kissed? And she smiled or she laughed. The Aisha Radhan has said that the Prophet kissed one of his wives. In actuality, she was talking about herself. And then when he asked her and he confirmed that piece of information, Bahikat, she smiled or she laughed, like she blushed. Uh Tirmidhi Rahimullah Ta'ala. He says regarding this hadith, and this is also a manifestation of what we said before many times, and also in the UK and other places, that this book is pound for pound the most beneficial of the six books of hadith. The most beneficial, not necessarily the most authentic, not the biggest, not the most famous, but is pound for pound the most wholesome book. Atinamid, he comments on this hadith by saying, uh, he says in this view and this opinion has been mentioned it's narrated for many of the great scholars of the early Muslims the companions of Muhammad and their successors the Salaf al-Salih the pious predecessors they all had the view that if a man kisses his wife he does not have to perform wudu he does not have to perform wudu and he says and this is the view of Sufyan al-Thawri rahimahullah and also the ulama of Kufa, meaning Abu Hanifa, his students, and those scholars who lived in that city in Iraq called Kufa. All of them held of you that if a man kisses his wife or a wife kisses her husband, he does not have to perform the wudu. Now before we move forward, there isn't, uh, there's no details mentioned here with regards to what type of kiss it is, what happens after the kiss, etc. Obviously, if he becomes sexually aroused or excited after the kiss, then that's a different story. With regards to your wudu being broken from pre-seminal fluid. But if it's not that type of kiss, it's a simple basic affection and kiss, then these ulama, they held the view that is directly extracted from this hadith. And that is that there is no wudu which is mandatory. A Tirmidhi, he then says, switching it up now, listen carefully. As far as Imam Malik, rahimahullah, and al awzai and there were other imams before the four imams that we've explained. There weren't just four imams, and there aren't just four madhabs. There were many, countless imams before, during, and after the time of Abu Hanifa, Malik, Shafi, and Ahmed. And those who say or believe or think or feel that there are only four imams, they are very extremely narrow-minded. And from those imams was a man whose name was Awzai, rahimahullah ta'ala. As far as Imam Malik, and also al awzai Shafi'i, Ahmad, and another Imam, Ishaq. Ishaq was a very close friend of Ahmad, and he was also a great scholar of fiqh and hadith, and a teacher of Bukhari as well. These ulama, they, ha they said the exact opposite, and that is, when a man kisses his wife, he must make wudu. He has to make wudu if he kisses his wife. Al-Dirmidhi, he says, and this is also the opinion of many of the companions as well, and many of their su successors of the Salaf. So we benefit already from the words of Tirmidhi after the Hadith, is that there are two views, and there is not consensus. The ulama do not agree that you have to make wudu, or you don't have to wudu. There is khilaf, there's difference of opinion. There's what? There's difference of opinion. An amount of respect to be given to both sides. Amount of respect to be given to both sides. So one may say, why do the ulama differ and the hadith clearly states that he didn't make wudu. Isn't that the hujjah, the dalil? Why, the, why are they even differing? And the hadith clearly states that he did it and he didn't perform wudu. Why do they differ? And it's a very important point for every Muslim to understand. The student of knowledge and also the 9 to 5 Muslim. The 9 to 5 Muslim, why do the scholars differ? And if you know why they differ, it oftentimes will put your heart at rest. And you won't be as confused or frustrated. And you won't have... Uh, the fear of someone coming to you and saying that your religion is made up, everything is difference of opinion, knowledge is so difficult, just do anything. It doesn't matter what you do because there's difference of opinion. It doesn't matter what you say because there's difference of opinion. Eat it, drink it, wear it, dress it, buy it, purchase it, lend it. It doesn't matter because there's what? Difference of opinion. That's not right. And there are reasons why there's difference of opinion. 
And all differences of opinion are not necessarily valid and correct. But just to know there's a, there's a science behind it. And they're not just fighting and differing for the love of fighting and differing like we do. We fight and differ just, huh? Just because you, you say sky is blue, it's red. Just because I don't like you. Or I have to prove that I'm better than you. Or my masjid or my dawah organization or whatever the case may be. As if you're a, a, a Jew or a Christian. As if you're from Ahl Kitab or a Mushrik. In which the Prophet Sallallahu did things just to be different from them. This is the mentality of many Muslims today, unfortunately. Unfortunately, they can't agree on the color of dirt. Is it red, brown, tan? And oftentimes it's not because it's different parts of the earth, but they want to differ just for the fancy of differing. For no other reason, just because you say, I want to say opposite. And this also applies to husband and wife, unfortunately, father and son. It makes sense. It's the right thing. But I'm going to do the opposite just because what? You said, you said it. And that's not what the ulama of Islam were upon. At-Tirmidhi rahimahullah, he says, وَإِنَّمَا تَرَكَ أَصْحَابُنَا حَدِيثَ عَيْشَ تَعَنَ النَّبِي صَلَى اللَّهُ فِي هَذَا لَأَنَّهُ لَا يَسْحِرْ عِنْدَهُمْ لِهَذَا الْإِسْنَادِ He says, and the only reason why our teachers and our friends, our companions, Malik, Shafi, Ahmed, these people, the only reason why they didn't take the hadith of Aisha is because they don't consider it to be authentic. They don't consider it to be authentic. In other words, they consider that hadith to be what? Daif. It's weak. And it's a very important benefit, something that you may not find in other books, the other books of hadith, is that Tirmidhi is saying why they differed. And it also goes to show us if that the delete is not authentic, then it's not necessarily a proof. And this also applies to your daily life. Why do you go here to this masjid? Because I don't believe that that's true what you're saying about this person. Didn't such and such do this? And doesn't brother such and such do that? And don't the people at this masjid say so on and so forth? I don't believe that. I think that the information is a lie. Or it's exaggerated. Or it's inaccurate. Why are you friends with such and such? Doesn't he such and such? I don't believe that. You may believe it, but I don't. And I'm only held responsible what I believe to be genuine and authentic. Or in the Islamic sense, the ilm sense. Why do you do this with your pants? Or why do you pray like this? And why don't you do this and say this after the salat? Because I don't consider it to be what? Authentic. But Abu Hanifa does. Or Imam Ahmed. Or Sheikh Hudaymin. Or Ben Baz. Or al Bani, Such and such. Student of knowledge says what? I don't consider it to be authentic. And I'm not responsible for their views and opinions. I'm only responsible for what? What I believe deep down in my heart as a talib al ilm. Are we understanding this? So this goes to show us that the hadith is the asal. That's the foundation of fiqh. Hadith is the foundation of fiqh. And if the hadith is strong, then inshallah the fiqh will be strong. And if the hadith is weak, then the fiqh consequently will be weak. So Tirmidhi says the only reason why they didn't take this hadith is because it's inauthentic. Which, and that also teaches us the opposite. That Chef Ibrahim Allah, if the hadith was authentic to him, he would have what? He would have taken it. And it is no option. The hadith is authentic, it's sahih. He has no choice but to take it. And that's what they built their madhabs upon. What they consider to be right or, or, or wrong. Everyone understand this. This is very important fundamental information for every single Muslim. Let alone the student of knowledge. Also in light of the confusion about madhabs. Do you have to follow it? Do you not follow it? Is it a bid'ah to follow it? Is it haram to follow it? Whose madhab is better? Abu Hanifa says this. The ulama. I follow the ulama. The confusion that the people live upon. Oftentimes, there's so much confusion, it's because we don't know the fundamental principles which allow you to be guided in the darkness of confusion. Al-Tirmidhi, he then says, quoting from other ulama who came before him, that Ali ibn al-Madini, the teacher of Bukhari, he said that Yahya ibn Sayyid al-Qattan, his teacher, said that this hadith, shibhu la shay, is of no use, is extremely what? Weak. So the Abu Hanifa, and Sufyan al thawri did they base their view off of this weak hadith? Or did they base their view off of the general principle? Is that wudu is not obligatory until it's proven to be broken. Uh, obligatory, yeah. Until it's broken, that you have to make the wudu. Al-Muhim, he's quoting those ulama who quote that this hadith is not authentic. He then says, وَسَمِيتُ Muhammad ibn Ismail يَقُولُ أو يُضَعِفُ هَذَا الْحَدِيثِ And I heard Muhammad ibn Ismail, meaning Imam al-Bukhari. Imam al-Bukhari was the direct teacher of Tirmidhi. So Tirmidhi in his book is quoting from his teacher. He says, I heard Imam al-Bukhari saying 
that Habib ibn Abi Thabit did not hear from Urwa ibn Zubair. And Urwa ibn Zubair is a narrator from Aisha. So this goes to show us that from the conditions of a hadith being authentic is that it must have a continuous chain of narration. Narrator A, narrator B, narrator C, narrator D. And each of those narrators had to have heard one another. The sheikh passed it on to the student, and then the student became a sheikh and passed it on to his student. If someone is in that chain and they didn't hear from each other or meet each other like this, then that is a reason why the hadith being weak. And this is also important information for every layman Muslim as well, is that hadith is a science. And there is not no haphazard, Bukhari just fell out of the sky and it's authentic. There's no haphazard Sahih Muslim and it's authentic. No, it's a detailed science. It's, 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 it's a, a, a system behind a hadith being graded to be authentic or not to be authentic. Tayyip. He then goes on to quote here is that there are other hadiths that state that the Prophet Sallallahu would leave the home, he would kiss her, and he would not make wudu. He says all of these hadiths here, none of them are authentic. About the Prophet Sallallahu making wudu, or not making wudu. So therefore, it goes to show us that when you study fiqh, is that there are other proofs and evidences. Just for a fiqh opinion or ruling to be there, it doesn't have to mean that there's an actual hadith. It could be based off of something else, a principle. It could be based off of the default. Everyone understand this? It could be based off of what a companion did. And some of them, they may, they may say that the safest thing to do is to take the hadith, even if it's what? Not authentic. Some of them, they may say the safest thing, I'd rather take a weak hadith than the opinion of someone else. Are we understanding this? Because we don't necessarily know 100% for sure that the hadith, the Prophet didn't say it. But the sign shows us that the percentage is what? Lower. The percentage of the narrator getting it right is lower than him getting it what? Uh, wrong. wrong. Everyone understand this? So the, the point is that the, the concept of fiqh and hadith and madhabs is a very long discussion. And the layman Muslim should learn the basics. If you have an appetite for knowledge, learn the basics. Study the basics. If you don't have a strong appetite for knowledge, and you want a simple, basic, easy answer, then ask someone that you trust and respect. Ask someone that you trust and respect, but do not be fanatical and clinging and clutching to your way, and it's the only way, and it's the best way, and all other ways are false and fake. And a student of knowledge is someone who is to read the books Go to the books, go to the classical information. Tirmidhi, he lived and died over a thousand years ago, 1,200 years ago. Go back to his book and read what he says. And don't suffice yourself with this modern day scholar or that modern day scholar or this person who's quoting Abu Hanifa and he's not even quoting him correctly. So the student of knowledge has a responsibility. The layman Muslim has a responsibility. You've only been studying for a couple of years. You have a responsibility. You've been studying for many years. You have a greater responsibility. Al-Muhim, at the end of the day, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala surely knows best, perhaps the correct view is, is that if a man kisses his wife, and he is not sexually aroused, and there's no pre-seminal fluid, pre-cum as they say, then his wudu is sound. And he does not need to make wudu. If you feel that it's best and safest to make wudu, and avoid a difference of opinion, that's nothing wrong with that. If you kiss your wife, your wife kisses you, and you become aroused and excited, and you drive to the masjid or walk to the masjid and you find some type of moisture or wetness in your underwear and you feel that you are aroused by that kiss then you need to do what's necessary with regards to washing and making wudu before you offer the salah but the sheer fact of touching a woman even if it's with a lustful intention or a woman kissing you or you kissing a woman does not necessarily break the wudu it does not necessarily what? Break the wudu until there's an authentic proof stating otherwise. Last but not least, this issue goes to show us that Imam Abu Hanifa rahimahullah and those ulama of Kufa, it wasn't just Abu Hanifa, everything that they said and did wasn't wrong. And it wasn't a bid'ah. As some people went extreme because they were turned off by the blind followers and the fanatics of Abu Hanifa. And they went extreme. And anytime Abu Hanifa said something, it was batil. And it's bid'ah. And it's out the window and it's crap and it's trash and the Hanafi Madhab is of no value. They went extreme. And they haven't realized that they pushed people away from the Sunnah by not giving respect where respect is due. Even if you differ with a person. So everything that Abu Hanifa said or did or his, his students said or did is not absolutely what? Useless. 
nor was everything that Imam Ahmed said correct and 100% right. Extremism is filthy and foul, no matter where it comes from, no matter who practices it. And fanaticism is ugly. Fanaticism for or fanaticism what? Against. And both of them push people from the sunnah. And hinder men from the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by bashing someone or by raising someone and putting them on a pedestal too high in which they belong. So balance, balance, balance. Respect, 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 moderation. And just like when you're driving a car and it's a narrow lane or the lanes are about to merge or it's wet and it's ice outside, slow down. They say reduce speed, right? You're coming up on an exit, 25 miles per hour. The speed limit was normally 65, 55. This is an exit. Slow down. Because if you drive too fast, you may spin out of control. You may flip. You may not be able to stop your car in enough time. So relax. As a student of knowledge, if you feel for or against the opinion, it's not going to hurt you to do what? Slow down. And you don't have to bash an imam or scholar every time you talk about an issue. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala surely knows best. Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen. A way so you can go get your car.